so we're now recording. So my name is Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning librarian for UNCG Libraries. Uh, in the past, we have done this series called Online Learning and Innovation in our um, webinar series, usually hosted by ITCs and ITS uh, staff and sometimes faculty, sometimes librarians, depending on what the topic is. And there they are. So based on us all working from home and faculty now all teaching online, uh, we added in a couple of sessions of panelists with experts on online learning at UNCG in order to, um, you know, hear more from them and get their expertise. So today we're going to be talking about best practices of virtual meetings. So um, we didn't know how many people were going to sign up. So we made this um, link that I'm about to drop in the chat for y'all to fill out questions. If you have a simple question too, you're welcome to put it in chat and I'll try to monitor it. But we're gonna start out, um, and these are, we're trying to keep them around 30 minutes. I scheduled an hour in case it went a little bit over. Um, and so I could uh, make sure everyone's questions were answered. Uh, but Amanda Shipman, who um, is gonna talk first, cause she has to go right at around uh, 120 to 130. Uh, so if you have any questions for her specifically, um, be sure to ask that uh, first. So uh, without further ado, we have uh, Rob, Amanda, and Anita, and I'll let y'all introduce yourself and tell you the title, your titles. I guess I'll go ahead and go. Um, my name is Amanda Shipman, and I am a, one of the cloud app admins in ITS. Primarily um, started off administering Canvas, but now um, administer and support Canvas, WebEx, and Zoom. So um, I'm Anita Warford and I'm the Instructional Technology Consultant for the College of Arts and Sciences. And so that's anything online course related, Canvas or Zoom or anything else. And my name is Robert Owens. I'm the Instructional Technology Consultant for the Bryan, well, one of two Instructional Technology Consultants for the Bryan School of Business and Economics. And so I support a number of learning technologies and uh, research technologies for the and classroom technologies for the Bryan School. Okay, so um, the question that's in the form right now, and again, y'all can put your questions in the chat, are um, someone is looking for suggestions on conducting virtual interviews with concurrent sessions. What program should I use? And this could be a good segue to talk about that we currently at UNCG have a couple of different options for SLMS or virtual meetings. So um, that is the first one. Yeah, why don't I go ahead and, and talk about those options and maybe that will answer the question or, or lead us to a discussion that, because I think there are numerous options for this, but um, here at UNCG, we do have three um, primary options for virtual classroom, virtual meetings, and that's of course Zoom, WebEx, and Google Meet. And a lot of folks wonder which one should I use? When do I know to use what? So it's really up to you. Um, primarily Google Meet is good for smaller uh, meetings with fewer participants. Um, not ideal for the classroom, well particularly a large classroom because um, if you host a meeting in Google Meet, you um, can't, as the host, can't control the participants and what they can do in that meeting. Um, so managing their microphones, their cameras, um, sharing their desktop, that's, that's all things the participant can do without any, um, any of the interaction or what's the word I'm looking for, any initiative from the host. So in a small setting, that's fine with a lot of participants um, that can be difficult to navigate. So um, Zoom and WebEx, um, pretty comparable products. We've had Web WebEx for several years now. Um, and in the during the beginning of the spring has started a pilot for Zoom because of the increased interest we had heard about folks wanting to use Zoom. Um, with the pandemic and everything, it just really progressed quickly. So we were able um, um, to license, fully license Zoom for everyone at that point. Um, so at this point, you have Zoom and WebEx for your larger meeting options, for your classroom options. Both of those products are integrated with Canvas. Um, if you're wondering which one you should use, it's 
probably just going to be a personal preference. Um, the feedback we receive about Zoom, I think, is that folks generally like Zoom and find it easier to use and navigate. The interface is a little cleaner if you're using Zoom versus WebEx training, which is um, what we normally suggest in, in Canvas when you're using it for the classroom, it's WebEx training. The interface there is a little clunkier, um, but it still has the pretty much the same functionality. Um, the only thing to consider really is participant numbers. So hopefully, hopefully you won't have a class with more than 300 participants. I'm sorry if you do, um, but um, for that, Zoom is going to allow up to 300 participants. Uh, WebEx, and to backtrack on that, we are working on getting licenses for larger meeting sizes, so that won't be that way forever. But for now, 300 participants for a Zoom meeting. Um, you can have up to 1,000 for a WebEx meeting. And um, you, to be honest, I forgot to check Google because I don't recommend large um, I don't recommend large sessions in Google Meet, so I don't know what the cap is for Google, but um, those are pretty much your three three options. I'm trying to make sure. Oh, recording. Previously, Google Meet did not allow recording. Um, Google has given us some recording capabilities um, through September 30th, so that's something that we temporarily have, but that's just another reason why typically for classroom use, we'd always recommended WebEx and, and now Zoom over Google Meet. Um, anything else that I'm missing that you guys can think of? Well, the only thing I think that I would add, Amanda, because it seems like the person asking a question was thinking about using um, the tool for interviews. And we've done a lot of interviews in the Bryan School using technologies like this. We have used WebEx in the past and we kind of moved on to Zoom for some of the reasons that Amanda mentioned that Zoom seems to have a cleaner interface and might be a little easier to use. It's usually better at detecting the person's um, equipment, their, both their speaker as well as their microphone when you're using um, Zoom, so there's a little bit less effort. One of the things to consider if you are gonna use Zoom for that particular purpose, or even if you decide to use WebEx instead if you're more comfortable with it, is that you wanna create individual sessions for each candidate um, so when you go into zoom.uncg.edu, you want to set up a link or a meeting for each interview. Because one of the mistakes that we made in the Bryan School in the past is uh, using the same room um, for interviews. And so you'd have like, a, you'd be in an interview and then the per next person interviewing would come into the meeting um, before their time. So it's important to create separate individual um, Zoom links or WebEx links if you're going to use it for interviews and then you need to follow some of the standards that have been posted by ITS about securing the Zoom room to make sure it's not Zoom bombed. And that leads into um, some questions we've also gotten um, about security and online meetings. Um, but uh, before that, uh, Rebecca just put it in a question, uh, Rebecca Adams, I want to host a reception for growth faculty and community partners. Is there a way that they can break into subgroups if they want to chat in small groups? Like what would happen at a normal reception? I am most comfortable with Zoom. Okay, well, I'll start with that one then. Um, so Zoom has breakout rooms or breakout groups that you can assign people to. Um, Amanda and I were testing this earlier and um, if you're going to use breakout rooms, you need to be on your um, the basically the browser version that you can't create breakout rooms inside of um, the mobile app. Uh, if you have people attending your Zoom session, um, they can participate in things like polling and breakout rooms, but you cannot create them in the mobile app as as instructor. So just keep that in mind first of all. Um, as far as I know, and maybe someone can jump in, but I don't, I think that you have to assign people to the breakout rooms. I don't think that you can create the breakout rooms and let people just pick them by topic, which I think might be what you want to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that you can do that. If, if I'm wrong, someone jump in, but I think you have to assign them. Yeah, I think you're right, Anita. We can, she and I can test it out and let you know for sure, but um, um, I'm pretty sure you have to assign them. 
um, they don't get to choose, like she said. Hi, this is Carla Wilson. I am an instructional technology consultant in the School of Education. And yes, you cannot create um, topic based rooms in Zoom and have people just pick which one they want to go into. Um, I recently had a faculty member who wanted to do that and I actually actually suggested they use WebEx to do that because with WebEx, they could create breakout rooms that then the individuals could choose which one to go in based off of the topic. So. Yeah, and that, that makes perfect uh, sense, Carla, because when you're using Zoom for breakout rooms, you only have two options as the instructor or the moderator for the room. You can randomly assign the participants to a Zoom room or, or to a breakout room, or the other option is to uh, randomly assign them. And so I don't think that would work for Rebecca either way or for Dr. Adams. So it seems like that WebEx might be the best way to go here. Great. Yeah. And um, so um, we didn't get a question in the form about this, but I have gotten a lot of questions from librarians in terms of hosting um, national meetings, you know, especially outside of UNCG with Zoom. And I know there's been a lot of press about um, Zoom bombing. So if y'all could just talk about security in terms of um, hosting these virtual meetings, uh, I would appreciate it. Thank you. I'll speak to that. Um, so I will say in IT, we've been following the media uh, closely as well as anything Zoom has put out to address the concerns. Our um, CISO or Chief Information Security Officer has been involved in that as well. Um, because we did quickly adopt Zoom, um, perhaps, uh, I won't say we didn't do a security review, but everything moved very quickly when we received permission to purchase uh, quicker than any any time before when we've adopted a product. So uh, we acknowledge that was done really quickly. Um, but again, a lot of this media coverage came after we adopted it as well. Um, I will say as far as Zoom bombing is concerned, um, we were um, really, as soon as things started coming out about that, we were lucky in that we had already configured a lot of our default settings in Zoom that, such that it would prohibit a Zoom bombing incident. Um, you would have to go into your own Zoom account settings and, and change those um, to make that more likely. But basically it's um, a person who's just getting a hold of a, a join URL or link um, and then joining your Zoom session and kind of just taking over because that person as a participant has privileges um, to do things like sharing their desktop, um, turning on their camera. And so they're using these functionalities or features in Zoom to, to do bad things. Um, so that's why we recommend things. And again, we've done this as a default setting in Zoom um, to create, make sure your meetings are have a password. Now, what you will notice is that um, the password is not required to join a Zoom session if you have the join link. Um, the password is only gonna be required if you actually go to the Zoom website and plug in a meeting ID, then you would need the password also to go along with that meeting ID. Um, but that does add um, some protection there. Um, hosts are the only ones who can share their desktop in a Zoom session. So anyone joining as a participant um, would not be able to do that unless the host enables that in their own account, or they can also make you a co-host in that Zoom session. Um, I'm trying to think, well, there's one last thing that we had enabled um, in there, I'm trying to think, but if you look at, if you go to the Six Tech website, sixtech.uncg.edu, we've got a couple of um, articles out there about prohibiting, you could take even additional steps to prohibit Zoom bombing. Um, and just, and I really hate that people have targeted Zoom because these are things that could happen in any really virtual meeting platform. Um, theoretically, they could, things like this could happen in WebEx and Google. Um, it's just that with the wide use of, of Zoom becoming so popular, they're kind of being targeted. Um, but if you go to sixtech.uncg.edu, there's a couple articles out there on things you can do in Zoom to, to make things extra secure. And um, an infographic 
which I know we've shared with the ITCs. I'm not entirely sure if we've made that publicly available, but I'll um, see about sending that out after this to you guys so that you guys have the infographic, something you can quickly reference to help secure your Zoom meetings. Yeah, that, that infographic is really great. Uh, we sent it out to all our Bryan School faculty and our Dean's newsletter, faculty and staff. One of the things that we, uh, one of the things I do now with my Zoom, um, when I'm creating Zoom meetings, I try to not use my personal meeting room as much since that URL will, does not change. But when I do use it and when I create any Zoom room, I like now used to uh, what's called the waiting room. I think that's the name of it, right? So, so what the waiting room does is person tries to join your room. If they do have the link, they basically have to wait. The host gets uh, a little pop up that says so and so is trying to join your room and you can either decide to let that person in or not let that person in. So that's one of the features that I've been using to try to prevent Zoom bombing. Great. So um, I have another question that's come up before um, in terms of Zoom and I guess WebEx if anyone is still using WebEx, but um, in terms of cre uh, creating registration to uh, a virtual meeting, um, I did that for this uh, panel in uh, Zoom uh, and what y'all recommend and if there's any um, kind of best practices for that as well if you're creating registration to a virtual meeting through these tools. So are you asking about, can we do registration for WebEx meetings? Yeah, like if there's a preferred one or if there's any like tips and tricks for doing it. Um, I don't, I think I did it for WebEx before yeah, the I, I want to say because forgive me because I've been so zoom focused I haven't used WebEx a lot recently um, but I want to say in WebEx you actually would use a WebEx event um, to have folks register which is very similar to those of you who've used zoom a zoom webinar which we don't currently we have some trial licenses for that um, but we have asked for pricing so that we can purchase this it won't be available to everyone in Zoom, but we would have to have a way to request for usage of these webinar add-ons is what they actually call them. And so that is very much what WebEx events are, um, which everyone does have access to in WebEx. Um, but basically it's kind of, it's good, would be good for this sort of setup where you have folks joining the session and by default, their mics are muted, their cameras are turned off and um, you have panelists in addition to a host. Um, so it's very good for these larger um, meeting type um, webinar scenarios, but um, registration you can enable on a WebEx event, but I don't think you can enable, and someone please correct me if I'm wrong, registration on a WebEx meeting. Um, I don't recall being able to do that. Um. So Charlie asked uh, about setting up a reoccurring meeting. It was the first Zoom meeting I set up. I wonder if I actually set up a personal meeting room or a personal meeting ID instead. So like, I guess, what's the difference between that? Well, if when you set up a WebEx Oh, WebEx Zoom <laughs> um, meeting, um, you are presented with the option to actually choose your personal meeting ID or have it, um, I think the wording is generate um, random ID. So you'd have to go back to the meeting. I apologize for that. I'm beeping. Um, you'd have to go back into the meeting settings and, and, and see. Um, if you chose personal meeting ID or random generated ID. Correct me if I'm wrong, since you sound like you've done this, Rob. Yeah, that, that's that's correct. So he would have to go back and check to see to make sure he didn't set it up using his personal ID when he created those uh, multiple recurring meetings. Okay, so other people, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. 
Is there um, anything that Rob, Amanda, and Anita uh, would like to say in terms of best practices of uh, hosting the virtual meetings, like uh, how you would recommend setting up the room, um, how to facilitate the pe uh, people in the room, um, just kind of a general, general suggestions? Um, I can start and then you guys can jump in if you want. Um, you have a lot of different options and I think it depends on your specific circumstance. Um, the first thing is I think some people don't realize or forget that um, if you go, even if you're using um, you know, Zoom inside Canvas on a mobile device or whatever, to just remember that if you go to the main website, the zoom.uncg.edu, that that's where your main settings are. And so all of these different things about um, all the different privacy and security settings, you can find those on that main website. So that's the first thing before you're scheduling anything to go in there um, and check your settings. Um, the second thing I think is when you're looking at, um, you know, enabling things like everyone having their audio and video on. I think that that, um, it depends on your particular situation because in a small group like this, I think video can be really nice because it adds a really personal element. You can, um, and if it's a class, you can actually, you know, see the people that are there, um, see what they're doing. Of course, it's great if you wanna do, um, you know, project presentations, anything like that. Um, Zoom has the ability to let you choose a virtual background, uh, which could be a lot of different things. It, it could be distracting you. Know, most of the time it's fun. Um, when I train faculty on this, as soon as they find that, you know, that's the most interesting thing. It's, you know, probably 10 minutes of people playing with different backgrounds. So it can be a fun thing. Um, but it can also be really useful because, you know, you may have a situation where some of your students have ended up back at home with their parents um, in their you know bedroom from high school or, or who knows what environment and they may not be comfortable with uh, sharing their environment so having that virtual background can also add an element of privacy while still letting you see the person um, uh, there are also circumstances there was an instructor who um, heard from a student who was concerned this was related to a Canvas course name, but you could sort of see this if you were doing a Zoom session too, um, where the student was taking um, a women's gender studies class and uh, I guess came from a really conservative family background. And so they were really nervous about participating and, you know, should the family find out what class they were taking. So those kinds of privacy issues, I think you want to think about when you're deciding about um, having students you know, use audio and video. If you have a large class, then you may want to just go ahead and disable audio and video for the students because otherwise it could be chaos and it could be sort of a, a bandwidth drain as well. So those are a couple things. Um, another thing, um, even if you schedule your Zoom session through Canvas, that's just an interface uh, to get you into the Zoom environment, whether you're on the mobile device or your laptop or whatever. So you can um, copy the invitation and send it to someone outside of your course if you're wanting to have a guest speaker. I had someone ask me about that this morning. Um, they were thinking that they would need to add someone to their Canvas course, and that's not the case. You can just send the, um, the join information to the person and then you could have your guest lecturer pop into the Zoom meeting like normal. So that's something else. Um, I guess another thing is, uh, you know, people were asking about how to handle large enrollments. And so in addition to, you know, thinking about the audio and the video situation, um, the fact that you can use the breakout rooms, you can also uh, schedule multiple sessions at different times, particularly in this case when, um, you know, we, these courses weren't initially meant to be online. A lot of people wanted to immediately jump into Zoom and that can be, you know, problematic from, for some students depending on the access that they have. And so if you want to have synchronous sessions, then you could schedule a couple of different um, date and time options to make it more likely that your students will be able to show up for that. So those are, um, you know, a few best practices. Um, 
And then the only thing, again, is to remember that if you want to um, initiate polling and breakout rooms as the instructor, to not do that in the mobile app. Anyone else? And um, I know that Amanda has to leave, so just in case uh, she could answer this question too. Um, Carla asked, what should you do if the virtual background doesn't work on your computer? For instance, if you try to use it and it gives an error that your computer cannot support that without a green screen, um, which Charlie before that pointed out. And I think Rebecca left, but someone pointed out that there might be a, uh, that the, uh, oh, okay, the current version of Zoom does not support this. Never mind. Okay, so that's the question about the virtual. Well, yeah, this is interesting because I can't say I've been asked this or encountered this. So I would have thought perhaps maybe depending on what was behind you, because I have noticed with the virtual backgrounds, they can be a little, um, behave a little weird and like you look pixelated a little bit when you're moving around. Um, and I don't know if it's due to what's in your background, if it's not a solid kind of um, color. You know, I'm not a video expert by any means, so <laughs> and I'm not tried it with a green screen to see how much better that actually works. So um, I, I'm interested in what the exact message is. So if, if, if Charlie or if Carla has seen this and they want to grab a screenshot for me and send it to me in email, that'd be awesome. And I'm happy to research. Um, but this is the first time it's come up and I didn't realize it had ever been a problem. So um, I'll take a look, but nothing comes to mind. Let's see, it works on my Mac, but not my Dell 2-in-1. Yeah, I, nothing comes to mind that would cause a problem with that, other than if it's not detecting, I don't know, enough light or something? I'm just guessing. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely take a look. I could pop in with one other quick uh, best practice before I forget about it is, um, I have seen this showing up a lot in like, um, Facebook and Instagram feeds where people are having a Zoom sessions with friends or coworkers or whatever, and they're taking um, screenshots of this gallery, sort of the Brady Bunch view. And uh, I don't think you should do that if you're in a course, because then you're going to be sharing, in essence, uh, you know, FERPA protected information with these student images, videos, names, etc. So um, I know that people have gotten excited about using Zoom and getting it to work and they love this gallery view. But, um, you know, if you're talking about a class with students in it, you know, definitely don't take a, a screenshot of that and save it. Well, one of the other things that I will add to about uh, best practices, um, just thinking in terms of if you are going to record your sessions, initially we were like, uh, at least in the Bryan School, we we're telling faculty to just um, in the settings, just have the meetings automatically record to the cloud. And unfortunately, um, that's that created some problems because one, because of Zoom bombing, uh, for example, what was, was happening, a lot of faculty were um, enabling join before host. And so as soon as a student would join, click on the, the link to join, it would start recording the meeting automatically. So the faculty member might have 15 or 20 minutes of just kind of dead space being um, recorded for their, for their classes. Uh, so if you are going to use um, record automatically, the first thing is you want to make sure that students cannot join before host. And you also want to make sure that you enable that waiting room so you come in as the instructor you start the meeting you allow your students in and then um and this is primarily for using zoom outside of canvas too and so you allow your participants in and then uh, the meeting will start to to record the other thing is to think about if you are going to use zoom to record your lectures like we have some faculty who are like maybe working on the weekends who are doing a lecture that they want to, to record that the students will watch before class, kind of like a flipped classroom environment. Um, it's probably better to record that um, to your local computer just in case. You can, so for example, we've had situations where a faculty member um, recorded a session on Sunday and they recorded to the cloud, but because a lot of people were using Zoom at the time, it took forever for that recording to render. Now we're having less, I will say that we're having less of that now. It seems like the Zoom has done things to uh, 
kind of kind of fix that. But just in case, if you want your video audit, if you're trying to record a lecture, you want to make sure you have access to that video within you know five to ten minutes. It's probably best to record it to your local computer. Just remember that when you close out of the session, a pop-up will appear saying that the video is downloading. You do not you do not want to completely close out before that video is downloaded to your local computer. Pop in with um, two other notes related to what Rob just said is. Um, I haven't I have not tested this myself yet, but I was talking with an instructor who uh, she was recording a zoom session for her class um, or with her class and um, She initially set it to um, To record locally and it was not recording the gallery view and she wanted to record this view of it and um, from the documentation I saw, I mean, I, I haven't tried, like I said, I haven't tested this yet, but from the documentation I saw, it said that you have to um, set it to record to the cloud if you want to capture this gallery view. And so she and I did test it and recording to the cloud, she did get it. I just haven't, I haven't tested recording the other way. Um, so that is one consideration, I guess. Um, and the other thing I thought I would mention is um, if you're going to be using Zoom for things like um, departmental interviews or meetings or whatever you know outside of a class it might be a good idea when you're first creating the room you have the option to go ahead and add an alternate host and you might want to do that um, in case you know for any reason when it comes time you know for the meeting to start if you can't get in or you know something has come up in life or whatever you can't be there someone else can actually you know get things going for you so those are just two other thoughts Great. So um, I did put the link to the um, uncg.zoom.us in there if people need it. A lot of the settings that Rob and Anita and Amanda are talking about um, can be set up there. Um, is it, it's in within settings, right? If you go to settings on the left hand side. Um, that's also where you could add um, the, I've had professors ask me about this if y'all want to talk about this, but um, the yes, no, go slower, go faster. You have to turn that on. Have y'all seen that? Like I'm seeing it in this meeting um, because I set it up in my profile. Um, but um, yeah, so if there's any settings like that beyond what y'all talked in here in there um, that you want to mention before we end it, uh, I put the link in there. So are there any other questions? Um, so yeah, Charlie pointed out that some settings are locked. Um, so um, any other questions before we uh, end this? I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I'm gonna check the Google form as people maybe are thinking of their final questions. Okay, any final words of advice, Anita, Rob, or Carla? I know you're in here. I mean, I would just say that, uh, you know, when we first started this um, remote learning and uh, pretty much overnight, everyone jumped to Zoom. So I was really afraid it was gonna pretty much crash the next day <laughs> and it did not so I have been really pleased with how well this has worked I haven't really heard from anyone who's had any um, performance issues with zoom uh, it, the questions that we typically get or that I have seen do involve the settings area well two things they do involve the settings area where people have just um, you know not looked at that not realized because there's um, one thing about Zoom is there are little settings menus in different places, but then if you go to that website that Sam linked in there, that's where all of your main settings are. And a lot of people uh, don't know to go there or they, they've been but they forget. And so you may sometimes enable settings that you have forgotten about. You know, we had one instructor who was pretty upset because her Zoom sessions were automatically recording and she didn't want that, but she had actually turned that on and so she had just forgotten. So just periodically check in there and see if your settings are still where you want them to be. Um, so that was the main thing. I think I forgot my other points. So Rob, anything? 
No, it's like I, I think we covered a lot of a lot of stuff in a short period of time. So hopefully everyone got something out of this particular session, maybe learned at least one thing new that they didn't know about. But I agree with Anita, you need to go look at those settings because there are so many different things there. If you have any questions, just contact your ITC. Yeah, and if Carla, you have anything to add, um, I just will say before people start leaving to, um, you know, I think everyone knows this in here, but just in case not, and for the recording, every academic department at UNCG has an ITC. Many of them are in the room right now. Um, if you uh, don't know who your ITC is, you're welcome to ask me in the chat and me or one of the other ITCs in the chat can let you know. Um, but um, they, they are the contact people to always ask questions to about um, instructional technology tools uh, for faculty. If you're a student in here, um, then uh, you would want to put in a six tech ticket and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong. And I would just chime in um, with what everyone else was saying about the settings. I know that with Zoom, you have the ability to use the Zoom desktop app and you can change settings there, but it's important to really use the link that Sam sent out to change the settings because when you do the setting changes through the desktop app, it doesn't keep those changes on different computers that you use. So whenever you use that to make those changes, you might use a different computer in your next meeting and realize that some of the settings aren't turned on or turned off like you thought they were and it's because they don't transfer over from one computer to the other so definitely use that link that sam sent one last thing too that just came back to me um the other thing i was going to say is uh particularly when we first uh got people into zoom we would get a question often where um uh, before you know zoom was officially approved that first week that we were remote a lot of people had um, myself included had created just you know uh, zoom accounts on our own not necessarily affiliated with uncg and then um, it became officially approved and so we migrated our accounts into the uncg one and um, i don't remember exactly what all of those different screens look like that you have to click through to to authorize your account into zoom but um, there is a button if you see where it's asking you um, how you want to log in. I think one option is like Google. There's another, I can't remember. And then there's login with SSO. And a lot of people I think don't know what that means. And so they'll say log in with Google thinking, well, we're using, you know, G Suite for email and things like that. But you want to say um, log in with SSO because that means log in with single sign on and that will pass you through so that you can log in with your UNCG credentials. So, um, and, and regarding this, like, sh connect with your contacts, um, you know, I don't know if that could be useful for just, you know, the general public who are out there trying to Zoom with their friends. I have, I do not ever do that. I mean, the people that I'm going to Zoom with, you know, I just send the inv invite. I don't, I mean, somebody else might have a reason, but I don't, I don't know why you would really need to authorize your contacts. Yeah, I wouldn't. And to be honest, I don't like using a desktop client for Zoom. I had so many support calls, primarily from what Anita was talking about, where people are not out there logging in with Google instead of using SSO. So I prefer faculty and staff to go to either uncg.zoom.us or zoom.uncg.edu. They basically take you to the same place. Um, and when it comes to your contacts, you can, if you're using the desktop client, you can invite your contacts if the person's not associated with your zoom account you can't make them a co-host or not i shouldn't say co-host say um, what's the term anita you can make a person a co-host once they join the zoom room but if you want them to be a if you want them to be able to start the session for you um they, they use a different term it's like a, another like a moderator co-moderator whatever it's called so if you want the person to like if you're not there and start the meeting for you. If you do have that person set up in your contacts, you can then put that person's information there um, so they can do that. But, but and I'm not sure how that would work though, because I'm thinking about it from using Zoom outside of the UNCG, uh, outside of UNCG accounts. That's what uh, I used it for with uh, my, my colleague um, before we had, um, before we licensed Zoom for the university. So, um, and maybe that's what it is, Charlie, then you can't add anyone outside of UNCG either because they kind of locked that down because when I was using a basic Zoom account, I could add uh, other colleagues or other people and then they could 
um, be a, like a co-moderator. So if I couldn't start my meeting, they could start it for me. So I would kind of just stay away from contacts. And to be honest, I would stay away from the Zenith desktop client for all the reasons that Anita and uh, Carla already mentioned. Okay, great. So um, if there are any other questions, uh, now is your time or else I'll start wrapping this up. Um, we do have another panel um, coming up on this Friday at 1030. Um, I'll drop the link to where I have some stuff on there um, in the chat. Uh, so this one is on um, uh, experienced online professors from UNCG talking about their experience teaching online. Um, they've been teaching online for years. Um, so if you have any uh, questions for them, uh, this will be uh, the similar format. Uh, it's on that home page right there. Uh, so it's this Friday at 1030. Uh, the panelists are Katherine Aldridge from Human Development and Family Studies, Pam Brown from Kinesiology EDD, and uh, Carrie Rosario from Public Health Education. So they all teach online. They've been teaching online for years and they teach synchronously and asynchronously. Uh, so if you have any questions about both of those techniques uh, from again, professors who've been doing it for a while, uh, definitely come. So uh, thank you all, Anita, Rob, and I know Amanda had to leave and Carla too, uh, who's helped uh, for coming and letting us know about your uh, best practices. And uh, I'm gonna end the session. Thanks everyone. Boom. Thanks Rob and Anita. I'll see y'all later. Thanks Carla. <laughs>